Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. I've had uh, so many things running through my mind over this week. And uh, I'm probably going to touch on just quite a few things that have just gone through my mind. I wanted to um, probably label it or title it Waffles. <laughs> because I'm probably going to do a bit of waffling. And, uh, you know, you can add your toppings to it, if you like, <laughs> uh, yourself. Um, I know why Jesus used parables, because uh, if you think about it, most of the time we're listening to stories, aren't we? Our lives, the stories, and we learn from what's going on. You know, you end up in a particular situation, and you're learning something from that situation. Don't you think that's that? For me, that's it. And I was thinking, you know, um, Jesus would sit and he'd say, you know, a certain publican or a certain man or a certain woman and I thought we could do this tonight and that would be great fun so we say you know a certain school teacher and you think oh I know what I know who Chris is talking about how many school teachers have we got in here tonight probably oh two oh so whatever Chris is talking about it's either Ruth or it's Jenny and we'd all go oh what's the goss or we could say a certain life coach. How many of them have we got in here tonight? Well, I know we've got one. Or we could say a certain preacher. You know what I mean? And you'd all think, ooh, what's going on? And you'd listen. We could say a certain farmer. <laughs> How many farmers have we got? Come on. There you go. And we'd all know who we were talking about. And you know, if we could only be so real as that. Because I reckon when Jesus talked about these things, I think the people didn't just think, oh, this is some sort of made up fable. I think that they're thinking, do you know, I think I know who he's talking about. Because, you know, I've heard something like this. And, and so they actually begin to get learning from life stories. And... Um, I'm going to give you one now, and it's going to be like this. A certain woman who had her birthday just a couple of weeks ago, 58-year-old woman who was in Las Vegas. Who would we be talking about? No idea. I'm going to give you a, a bit of a parable because um, I uh, was round the, the beautiful swimming pool, 107 degrees, and I suddenly say to Anth, oh, it's cold. And he said, uh, cold? What do you mean it's cold? It's not cold. And uh, so we get into this conversation that what I had just done was taken a feeling that I had and turned it into a generalization that meant Everybody was experiencing what I was experiencing. Yeah? And so he turned to me and he said, It's not cold. It's 107 degrees. Yeah? But my experience was that I was cold. And it was really funny because we goes into the, the apartment and it's still 73 degrees in there with the air conditioning on. And would you believe I had a blanket around me and he sat in shorts now you're thinking, what on earth's going on? Are you sick or something? No, actually, see, the, the, for me, if there is too much of a difference between what the temperature is outside, 107, and 73, I will feel that cold like you would not believe. Do you get me? Right, let me tell you something else. I get up to Vancouver, and it's only 69 degrees, right? And I never had my cardigan on once. Why? Because there was a, a, a consistency that you sort of, your body gets used to it. You're not going from hot to cold and it's like, 
But here's my point. There was a truth there. I was cold, but it was not cold. So I can be a modern day parable of what? Of how we want to put our feelings onto somebody else and make them believe that what I'm experiencing is the general truth. Is that fair enough? That's a good parable, isn't it? It's not necessarily the accurate reflection of truth, what I'm feeling. I was cold. Is that fair enough? I was cold, but it wasn't cold. Now you might think, well, what's that got to do with, with anything? We have to learn that there are so many things that are going on around us. And I've spoken about this in, in the past. We, if we could only be very honest and tell our stories as they really are, we would actually learn a lot from each other. But most of the time, we're always hiding. And there's been all sorts that's been going on this week and I've been thinking, do you know what? If only we could tell that story and make it public, actually people could learn an awful lot, but I just can't do it. But then I think, okay, let's go back to then some of the stories of the Bible and see if we can learn something that way. So I was, again, in one sense, forced to go right back to Genesis chapter 3. Because the story of Adam and Eve, whether we actually believe it is a true story in the sense that these were the very first two people that were ever created, and they may well have been, but you know, I mean, think about it, let's be logical. Something had to start us all off, so whether it was them two or another two, I'm not that bothered, but we know that something had to start it all off. Or whether it's symbolic, the story is symbolic of, of humanity and the way we operate, because that's true, isn't it? Whether it's a story or whether it's about the birth of a nation, Israel, as some people believe. The, the truth is, regardless of what we think about it, there are lessons in that story that we can learn about ourselves because it's about humanity. So we haven't got a lot of time, so I'm going to just be very, very quick. Then the man, this is Genesis 3, and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he wa was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Awesome. Where are you? Now what I find, the longer that we read this story, the more we tend to put uh, sound effects on certain words. It's almost, where are you? Or it's not just, how about, where are you? You get me? It becomes something because we read into it what we have come to believe about the story. So I even just did it then. Where are you? It might have been just, and the Lord looked for him, called to the man and said, where are you? Who thinks that that might have been it? I think it might have been. He might have been saying, hey, where are you? And, he, and Adam answered and he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid. So we've got some truth there, haven't we, coming out? And then, of course, God says, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you've done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, I'm not going to go any further into the story than that, other than to say, from the first question that came from God to the woman, in whatever tone or whatever it was like, the point was the immediate reaction was to bat it back and basically start saying, it's not my fault, it's yours. Can you see it straight away? I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid. And we've heard this so many times before. But like I'm saying, if we're going to try and learn something from this, can we accept that as human beings, this is what we tend to do? Now, you see, I've learned over this last week that I can be in very, very serious trouble for asking questions. And the silly thing is that when I realize I'm in trouble for asking a question, 
I can't for the life of me understand why that question got the reaction that it did. Because I'm thinking, hang on a minute, I only said, where are you? A bit like that, I only asked where you were. And it was like, yeah, why? Why is that? Because I'm thinking, I, I just don't get this. You see, the issue is, if we aren't willing to hear the question in a loving light, loving light, we will never ever respond in proper truth because we're always going to be justifying the reason why we where we are isn't that isn't that right so a loving light comes to you and says where are you if you hear that in a loving light you're probably going to say i'm here i'm behind this rock i've, I've really messed up uh, i'm coming out i really don't know what to do but can you help me fix it agree isn't that a better response but instead, if you hear it in such a way that is, 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 is condemning, you'll think immediately, hang on, I'm going to bat it back. And that's exactly what uh, Adam did. I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. And then, of course, it gets even worse because once another question's come from God, which I'm... I, I don't think it's bad, do you? Well, who told you you were naked? I think these are very reasonable questions. But of course, Adam wasn't feeling they were very reasonable. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? And the woman said, uh, the man said, the woman! <laughs> we all know. And you see, this is called scapegoating. I hate scapegoating. I really do. And that's why even in our understanding of Jesus and, uh, and the cross and God... Even the thought of, of, of Jesus being God's scapegoat, I can't stand it. I really can't. I feel it's insulting. Because when we put blame on something else, which is not correct, it's scapegoating. Is that making sense? So anyway, scapegoating began. And of course, once the woman realized that Adam was blaming her, then she had to find somebody else to believe. So she didn't just say, hang on a minute. It was, the, oh, well, okay, if, if we're going to play this game, points at the snake, oh, well, it, it was his fault. It was him. Do you get me? So anyway, what I find with this is that if we do not hear questions that are asked in a loving light with the belief of some, you know, we've just been singing that, you're a good, good father, that's who you are. Didn't Adam and Eve believe he was a good, good father? What was going on in their heads that made them think somehow that that question was going to come with such condemnation? Why wasn't it just a question? What was their relationship up to this point? Why did they have any reason to sort of get this idea that, that you know, we, we, well, we're doomed? Now, we always believe when we're in this uh, frame of mind that, it's, that somebody is trying to expose us. And when we feel that we're going to be exposed, the best thing to do, <laughs> this sounds awful, this, but the best thing to do is expose yourself. <laughs> I know that sounds weird. You know, we think of Dirty Max syndrome, don't we? You know? <laughs> but if you think somebody's out to expose you, do you know what the best thing to do? Just expose yourself. If you come clean, you can't let them expose you. you got, does this make sense? If you're willing to say, hang on, no, no, hang on, you're not going to tell me what I am. I am willing to tell you the truth. Then you don't have the possibility of a, a made-up story or a concocted story. You can say, hang on, I'll come clean, I'll tell you. Do, do you get me? But of course, the whole thing about not wanting to be exposed is because they feel in some way that the story is not going to be quite what they want it to be. But anyway, moving on. It's interesting, when we uh, said a few minutes ago what their view was about God up to this point. Get to verse 21, and I find it interesting because we have all this issue about, you know, cursed you'll be, cursed you'll be, this and that and the other. And then verse 21, you've got God making clothes to cover their nakedness. Now, I don't know about you, it's a bit contradictory in my head if on the one hand you're telling them this, this is what, how it's going to be, it's going to be bad, 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 in the next breath he's saying, come on, I'll make you some clothes. 
I know you're thinking, well, why not? I think it's because we are contradictory like that, because we decide, okay, I can give you a right good shouting at, and I can put you in your place, and then the next minute we're all as right as rain. Do you not think that that's how we can be? Well, I think, I think that's how we are. And because we can be that changeable, we'll say, oh, that's it, God's the same. So he has this right big rant, and then he goes and says, oh, all right, I'll make them some clothes now. For me, I think that's so anti-character, and I don't know whether it just looks good in the story. And remember, there's lots of creation stories. There's lots of things out there that, uh, that basically are the tale of how it all came about. And this is, let's just be honest, this is one. This is the one that Christianity adopted. And I am not saying it is not right, but I'm saying it's a story that says how things came about. And in it, you've got the good, you've got the bad, just like any good epic, right? And it leaves you with this attitude about the creator that I'm not sure was how God wanted himself writing up, but that's how he got written up, and that's what we, we've, we've got here. But you see, isn't it interesting how then the church, if you think about it, has this, and it's, it, it's embraced it, this emphasis on both God's wrath and his love. Think about it. His love, I'll clothe them, I'll make coats of skins, but his wrath is, I'll curse you first. You got, uh, can you see the picture? I'll curse you first, but then I'll make you clo uh, uh, cover you with, with clothes. And so in the church in general, right across the board, you've got this, uh, like a confusion that starts right here that's saying, do you know what? Let's not confuse God's holiness, God's uh, just, justice, God's judgment alongside his love. And instead of actually saying, do you know what? I don't know if this is being written up this way because I want to see God having these two extreme characters which actually helps us always keep within the right, wrong, good and evil uh, explanation of how the world works. Now, I hope that was a, I hope I explained that well because it's a pretty difficult thing to explain. But you see, you have to have something that tries, and ex tries to explain what we call original sin and then the reason for the cross to put it all right because you have to have something to deal with one thing and the other. But for me, this is not the behavior of someone whose only desire is to expose you. Think about it. If God's where are you, all he has in his heart is to expose you, well, then he's not going to make you any clothes because he's going to say, I'll tell you what, you've done this for yourself. There you go. You've Just carry on. You yeah? Why would he need to do any anything else? Anyway, so here's the thing. Is the question, where are you? Is it perceived as a doorway to grace or is it, let me look down here, um, I've lost my place, or a doorway to shame and punishment? And I, I know that as I handle things in my life, when I ask people questions, they can say, you are wanting to shame me, you're wanting to expose me, when actually what the question does is opening a doorway to grace. It's not a doorway to shame, it's a doorway to grace. And we, we are left with a situation that we never know what might have happened should they have stood up and said, had a different response to the where are you than what we have in the story. So, whatever you believe about God, and I've said this many times, it will be how you perceive people, whether it be your boss, whether it'll be your mother, whether it'll be your father, anybody who has a, a, any type of authority at all, that's how you will perceive them. And when they ask you questions, if you're not wanting to step up and be honest and open, you will actually have this idea that they're just wanting to expose you and dominate you and crush you, rather than saying, they're opening up a door for me to step forward and, and embrace Grace. Now, you might say, well, I've never experienced that. 
Do you know, problem is we most of the time don't want to experience it because we want to keep control over everything. So we would rather stay hidden, keep our blame game going on, and live in what we've got, even though we're desperate to break out of the situation that we're in. Now, just um, a little story again, another little parable. Um, we were in the car the other day, and now Riley, we were on the way to school, and it had you know, been a little bit stressful getting ready, as you know, it can be with kids. And um, I was sat in the, the front of the car, and Riley's getting all upset, and I, and I says, oh, Riley, sweetie, don't get angry. Just very quiet, calmly. It wasn't a snap. I didn't go, hey, hey, stop it. Come on, be honest. Isn't that often what we do? But I just said, Riley, darling, don't get angry. And his reply to me was, <laughs> he says, Grandma, I'm not getting angry. You're making me angry. <laughs> no word of an exaggeration. That was exactly what happened. And I thought, whoa, four and a half years old. He's already learned how to bat the question back and play the blame game, scapegoating, because he wasn't willing to say, yes, Grandma, I'm getting angry, and I'm getting angry because of X. Now, answer the question. If he'd have said that, what would Grandma have done? Grandma would have said, oh, sweetheart, and we would have tried to explain the, what the ex was about and how we deal with it, what we can do. You see, most of the time we don't believe that people are on our side. We don't believe God's on our side. We always think somehow we're, we've got to be our self-defenders, our self-protectors. And it gets us into so much trouble. So, of course, I'm trying to help Riley at four and a half <laughs> realize that he's not going to be in trouble for being angry, but he has to own it. <laughs> you might say, he's four and a half, leave the kid alone. No, he has to own it. Because unless he learns to own how he feels, he will think, right, from now on, that worked. I can just find anything that goes on and find someone else to blame. And it's true. And I don't want us as a house to be like that in any way. So when the question's asked, where are you? How about just saying, oh, I was going to do a Gregory. I'm here, Daddy. Do you That's ancient, isn't it? Heck, showing my age. Hi, Gerald. Elsie. Bless them. Um, but how about that? And how about believing when we step up to the plate and say, I'm here, that the person is actually wanting to help sort things out rather than condemn. Wouldn't that be a good idea? We've all got to learn a bit of that, haven't we? So I've had quite a few situations this last week where I've thought to myself, heck, I have been made the one who suddenly, it's, it's my fault. Riley, you know, and a few others, it's my fault. And I'm thinking, well, it wasn't my fault. I haven't done anything, you know. Just lately, I've been um, noticing that when I send texts to people, right at the end, I put live you instead of love you. Has anybody noticed? It's because I my finger somehow will not hit the O. It hits the I. And even though I can try then, oh, go back, try again, it'll still hit live you. And I thought today, I thought, you know, maybe that's not a mistake. Maybe that's something that God wants me to put on everybody's text that I send. Because what I have understood is that many times we can send a, a, a wonderful, love you, but live you, whoa. Much more important, because how many of us are dying because we're behind the rock, not wanting to come out where the where are you is, right? 
and hiding and blaming, which is causing us to shrivel and shrink in ourselves rather than being willing to say, look, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to be counted. I'm going to come clean. I'm going to say it like it is. And I'm going to realize that people are, are for me. We have sung a lot tonight about the kingdom. And um, I think many of us misunderstand what the kingdom is. I think when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, I think probably it mostly it's interpreted as, as this place where you either go or you don't go when you die, right? So it's heaven or hell or whatever. So the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And we've so misunderstood that because actually Jesus wasn't talking about that at all. He was actually talking about his kingdom of rulership. And um, what you have to understand is that our understanding of kingdom in our culture is nothing like the kingdom that he's talking about. And again, we've been so uh, indoctrinated in our own societies is that we struggle to believe that the kingdom that, God's, uh, that Jesus was talking about, God's kingdom, isn't the same as what any other kingdom's like. And we're thinking, oh, well, it's all right. It's just, it'll be his kingdom and not the kingdom of America or the kingdom of Russia or the kingdom, kingdom of Britain. And actually, it's not like that at all because what you find, it's really an upside down kingdom. And everything that is professed and, and, and ministered by Jesus is everything that most humans struggle to be. For instance, you know, the, the, the first will be last, last will be first. You know, it's all opposite. And, and things like, you know, laying down your life in order that you might live. It's everything that goes against the grain of humanity. And kingdom living is something that just somehow grates on us. And even to the point that even in the church, we get to the point where we're trying to hype up this kingdom that's all big guns and, and I don't know how to explain it, but very triumphalism and it's all big. Yeah, actually what Jesus is saying is, no, become a little child. Humble yourself. Give everything you've got. Uh, don't just work, walk one mile, walk two. Uh, don't just give the shirt, uh, the cut your coat off your back. Give them, give them your shirt. Everything is pushing us all to the degree that we say, nah, I don't really want that. I really want my own identity. I want to be able to say that I'm self-sufficient. I want to be able to say that I can do this. When actually, what's really coming to us through the kingdom is die, 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 die. And we don't want to. So, how am I going to finish this? Life asks us the hard questions. Circumstances ask us the hard questions. People can ask us the hard questions. God might be asking you the hard question. I'm not saying it's where are you. It might be totally different in your life. It might be what you're doing. It might be, why did you do that? Or, I don't know, it might be just something really quite, I don't know, very seeming very normal. But the issue is how you hear it will determine how you respond. Will you hear it as a, a, in, in a loving light? See, we talk about a loving gaze, don't we? Do you believe that you live under his loving gaze and that what he wants to do for you is constantly to lift you up? But it talks about he only lifts those up who are first willing to be humble. It's an opposite thing. And so what I want to do is just basically say of you in this house. Uh, there is a, I said it a few weeks ago when he talked about, um, I need my anki. Um, when he talked about roots, he says there's an extra level of faith that's required, you know, different type of faith that's required to get out of a rut. Well, I really felt what was on my heart with bringing this as I've brought is that there is a, a, an extraordinary type of grace that we need to actually live out the kingdom. And I know at times we can all say, oh, 
I know what grace is. I've received grace. But I don't know. Because when we get to the place where sometimes we are believing that we're about to be exposed or believe somebody's trying to expose us, we have to have a grace that says, do you know what? I will understand just how much people are wanting me to be real and actually operating this opposite spirit that says, you know what? The kingdom will only be seen and understood if I can operate in this level of grace that is not just about, you know, if I've heard people say, oh, that was kind, you know, that was very gracious of you. Well, most of the time, the grace that, we're, that we understand like that is actually, well, anybody, that's normal. Are you with me? Oh, well, that was gracious. What we're talking about is a grace that we understand when we actually do not have the ability to accept what has just happened. That's when the grace that we're talking about kicks in. And with each other, we have to say, are we willing to operate in a grace that, no, I can't, because it's just unreasonable, it's just unacceptable. But what we do is we say, yes, but hang on, the grace that God has shown for me is that level of, of incredible grace. And I believe as we're talking amongst ourselves about living the kingdom, it's going to take an incredible, remarkable type of grace with each other. Like we've talked in the past, there's no deal breakers. I'm believing that the questions that we ask each other are from a loving gaze that's actually saying, let's talk about this. Let's reason together so actually we might, we might fix it. Yeah? Does that make sense? So, where are you? <laughs> where are you? Respond in the sense that you're saying, I will expose myself. I will tell where I am in order that the truth might set me free. Yeah? That the truth, I shouldn't say set, I should say make, make, make me free will be forcibly imposed upon you that freedom. And I want to say that I want to do that with you. I want you to do that with me. And it's true, you know, most of the time we can be, it's always, I would, I'm sure our Riley found it far easier to tell me I was wrong than he could have told me he was wrong about himself. Do you see what I mean? It's always easier to tell somebody else, isn't it? But let's decide that actually our honesty is going to be about ourselves and be willing to come out from behind the rock and uh, hear that, where are you, in a loving light. And I believe that we'll shine. We're all crackpots, aren't we? We're all crackpots. And, um, you know, we just want to shine. So if you get a text from me and it says, live you, don't, don't think Chris has spelt that wrong because I'm going to leave it from now on because I believe that there are times when it's more important to tell somebody to live than it's probably to tell them that you love them. Just love can be just a, can't it? But live you, live you. Let's kick off any, any of this stuff that's causing us to rot behind rocks. And let's stand up and let's live out the kingdom we've been singing, seeking first the kingdom of our God. And I hope we're going to do that together. Yeah? Okay, thank you. I'm done. Bless you all. It's going to be great next week. Come, please support us. I'm longing for everybody to see just how many people we've got when we're all together. That's going to be so encouraging in itself. We want you to see your family, your whole family together. It's going to be wonderful. And I appreciate there's going to be some away, but let's still do our best to, to create that awesome oneness together, yeah? Okay, thank you. Bless you. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others. <laughs>